one top concept with which many astronomy students struggle is the expansion of the universe, the expansion of space itself from a hot, dense beginning, which we call the Big Bang, up to this very dilute, giant universe that we see now. And in particular, this expansion doesn't have a center. Either the universe is infinite or it somehow wraps around itself and the center is in a dimension that we can mathematically describe but not physically access. We take great pains to explain this tough abstract concept clearly in the cosmos. We give a number of analogies such as a rubber hose with ping pong balls on it or a balloon or an expanding loaf of raisin bread. We really try to get to the parts that students don't understand and that's through our decades of teaching this course. We have much experience teaching this course and so we've seen the kinds of struggles that students have had. A second concept of great difficulty for many students is the notion of warped space and time. The idea in Einstein's general theory of relativity that the presence of mass, of material stuff or energy, actually changes the shape of space itself and the passage of time. This is really a tough concept. So we address this concept thoroughly in our book with analogies like a rubber sheet stretched across a drum head where you flick a ball along it and it goes in a straight line, but then you put, say, a bowling ball on top of the sheet and it bends and then the flicked ball follows a curved path. We, met, we give many examples of that sort and we relate that concept to the notion of black holes where the amount of mass and the amount of cur curvature of space can be so great that nothing, not even light, can escape. Many students have trouble with the concept of stellar evolution. The fact that stars actually have lives that they live, they're born, they live, they die, and the kinds of physical processes that are going on in the different stages of stellar evolution. Because, you know, over a human lifetime, you just look at the sun and it doesn't look like it's changing at all. But over millions or even billions of years, stars do change. So we discuss quite thoroughly the birth of stars, how they generate energy through nuclear reactions during the normal course of their lives. And then the different forms of stellar death, the way our own sun will puff out to a red giant in five or six billion years, then gently ejecting its outer atmosphere of gases, how more massive stars can actually violently blow up in this tremendous act of self-destruction at the end of their lives, and then how different types of the deaths of stars can lead to compact objects such as white dwarfs, which is what our sun will become, neutron stars, which are even more dense than white dwarfs, and ultimately even black holes, which are so dense that nothing, not even light, can escape. We go through these different stages of stellar evolution and the different endpoints of stellar evolution quite carefully in our book, trying to distinguish for students the differences among them, but also the broad similarities that tie the topics together. Curiously enough, many students have trouble with everyday celestial phenomena that everyone is familiar with, but few people actually understand, such as the phases of the moon. The phases of the moon are not caused by Earth's shadow falling on the moon or clouds in the atmosphere or anything like that. They're caused by changes in the relative geometry between the sun, Earth, and moon. And we illustrate how to understand the phases in a simpler way by looking at a diagram, one key diagram that we tell the students, you know, if you understand this, you can reproduce the answer to any question that anyone ever asks about the phases of the moon. If you just understand this one diagram, it's amazing how infrequently people understand truly the phases of the moon. The tides on Earth's surface are a concept that many people don't understand and that students in particular might have misconceptions about. They may have heard that the moon pulls the water on the near side of Earth toward the moon. But in fact, there's a bulge on the diametrically opposite side of Earth as well. 
putting it another way, there are two high tides per day and two low tides per day. And that's something that if you live in a coastal region, you might experience on a daily basis, but not fully understand. And students who don't live in coastal regions might not even be familiar with these changing tides and why there are two high tides and two low tides per day. So we discuss the tides in some detail. Well, Jay Pasikoff and I really enjoyed writing this book because both of us have this deep desire to increase the public understanding of science and the appreciation of science, in particular astronomy, astrophysics, the sky. I think everyone has this desire, this curiosity about the universe in which we live. They've all looked at the stars, they may wonder about our origins. And one of our goals in writing this book is to introduce students to the richness of the universe, the beauty of the universe, and the great feeling of accomplishment and gratitude that scientists get in understanding some aspects of the universe and passing on that understanding to students.